We're live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome everyone to the second Rooted Vermont Water Cooler chat series. I'm your host. I'm Ted King. Uh, our first chat was, of course, last week on the topic of nutrition that was presented by Untapped and the specific topic of how to fuel. We had a couple world champions on that uh, particular call. And just a reminder that no matter how you are watching this video, whether it is YouTube or Facebook, whatever it is, we receive your questions. They're funneled together. So please, off to the right, comments, send them on in to our very cool guests. We have an excellent water cooler chat series this evening. Let's start with a quick round of introductions. Lael Wilcox is the best female ultra endurance cyclist in the world. Boom. She's uh, traveled and ridden more than 100,000 miles in more than 35 countries, probably far more than that since I've picked up this particular sliver of information. She's a huge advocate for the sport as she does tremendous things to especially get more girls on bikes, beginning with a program called GRIT, Girls Riding Into Tomorrow. Folks, please check out what she is doing with GRIT. Our other esteemed guest is Jan Heine, president and head of R&D at Rene Ayres Cycles. Jan is the editor-in-chief at Bicycle, excuse me, Bicycle Quarterly. This world-renowned randonneur has a PhD in climate change, which he turned into a career in cycling. He's an author of multiple books, most notably and highly recommended, The All-Road Bike Revolution, with a foreword by yours truly. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jan and Lael to the Water Cooler Chat series. Let's set the scene for each of you. Lael, beginning with you, where are you right now? Yeah, right now I'm in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, this is my first time meeting Ted, so happy to get to talk with, with both Ted and Jan. It's fun to catch up, even if we're not really in the same place. Very true. Jan, how about you? Where are you and, and what is new and newsworthy in your world? Where am I? I'm in Seattle, which is uh, where we're located. Um, and uh, what's new and newsworthy? I don't know, you know, there's always stuff going on. Um, <laughs> great to catch up with both of you. And I'm glad we don't have to wear masks because we're socially distant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, excited to be here tonight. Very nice. So, Lael, you are in cycling hotbed, Tucson, Arizona, a place that I've spent, a place that many cyclists have spent time on two wheels. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, Jan, I think all cyclists, we want to gain a sneak peek behind the scenes, especially into the cycling industry amid a pandemic and coming out of a pandemic mm -hmm. with glimmers of normalcy coming back to modern day living. Quite frankly, how have your springs mm -hmm. 2021 gone beginning with you Lael. yeah they've been it's been good you know i've been riding uh mostly just out of tucson since last november uh and then any real travel plans have just been planned and dreamed and mostly canceled but you know then i like wake up and the sun's shining and i can go for a bike ride and so i'm so grateful for that uh, if I go out and spend the night outside, then I'm even happier. If I'm riding with Rue, I'm the happiest. But um, I am really looking forward to things opening up a bit and being able to do a bit more uh, in different places. Um, so it's been good, but I think it's getting better too. And Jan, yeah, with a with a perspective of the coming from the industry and as a fan and member of the cycling industry. Jan, what do you what have what have you seen the past five months, and what do you see going forward? Well, um, how to say? There's all kinds of stuff happening. Of course, um, the good thing is that my job is also testing tires, and uh, when we get new prototypes, I have to ride them. So no matter how busy I am, uh, I get to get to ride my bike a lot, and uh, we've had a great spring here in Seattle. It's been relatively dry, and um, so just, uh, I can't complain. I mean, we're all waiting now, not so much for the country to open up, but for the high passes of the Cascades to open up. Yeah. There's like 10 feet of them. But um, now we're already making plans of where we want to go and what we want to explore and stuff like that. I mean, there's just a normal mayhem of the bike industry and it's even worse now than, than usual. <laughs> it's true. Bikes have never been more popular. 
I mean, yeah. it's out of control, right. you know, to where there's, I mean, for you, Jan, it just must be wild with, with production. It's so hard to, to really get your hands on anything as, as from sponsored rider, consumer, any of that. So what a wild time. Everybody wants to ride bikes, which is something to really celebrate. It's really cool. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So go ahead. Dave. Um, so Leo, you are a world-class, especially multi-day bike packer. Now, speaking in generalities, how in tune are you with your equipment? For for example, do you know your precise tire pressure or uh, are you the kind of person who's going to wing it? Are you particular about the way that you're packing? How do you how do you sort of oversee that that side of things? I mean, I love like even talking about this stuff because it's like world class. Well, it's all about results. But then, you know, when you look at bike packing, it's self-supported. I've seen you've been getting a bit into it, Ted. It's like you're just sleeping in the dirt or not yeah. sleeping. Yeah. And Jan's yeah. been doing this for so long. And like just you, you, everybody like it's like you can relate so much more to like the what you endure out there day after day in like riding through all the elements. And then it's like, OK, you know, you you feel your body and your bike probably in equal terms <clears throat> it's like do i need do i need food do i need water does my bike need something is it available and then it's like well most of the time it isn't so you just deal with what you have so you feel things like not going that well but you're like okay i'll just deal with it and you get more and more used to the equipment that you're on or or the state that your body's in or where your mind's at uh, so of course i i definitely don't know my tire pressure but uh i think you feel when something's really going wrong. And then you're like, well, I need to deal with that. But for the rest of the time, it's like, is it worth stopping and looking at or should I just keep going? And most of the time, the answer is like, you should just keep going. Don't worry about it. I mean, yeah. like that's, totally. that's just how it has to be because if you stop for every little thing, then you waste so much time stopping. And then you're like, and then you are kicking yourself later for stopping so much. So it's like, okay, uh, in this moment, like, is it going to drive me crazy? Should I stop? Or is it a mistake to not stop? Because like, you know, my clothing's rubbing in a weird way and that's going to cause like a, a huge gash later, something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. I guess that's, that's a weird balance, but I feel like I'm always focused on spending, staying on the bike as much as I can. Cause it's like the more you stay on the bike, more distance you cover. Sure. Makes total sense. Jan, you are you are no rookie to, to multi-day events. Uh, you've been talking to me about Paris Press Paris for quite a while. Um, same question. Where do you fit on the on the spectrum of how meticulous you are about your equipment? I think just like Leo, when you get to the really long distances, you think about keeping going is the main thing. You know, if you stop, it's almost impossible to catch up. It's, I remember one brevet was a 600K and we were in a group of four people and two were really flagging. So we finally said, okay, we're gonna split up here. You go slower, we go faster. We went ahead and I mean, you look back and they were gone. And then we got kind of tired and we said, let's just stop. There's a nice bench there and sort of, you know, drink something, eat something and not eat on the bike. It was like less than a minute and the other guys caught us. After we had worked for yeah. a whole hour, you know, to, to just get ahead. <laughs> so you think about if you stop to adjust your tire pressure, it's like, you're never gonna get that back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So great little segue saying tire pressure there. Um, Jan, you have been a pioneer in running wider supple tires for years. Now I'm curious mm, if you thanks. feel anything like the Pied Piper now that we've seen a, a migration. I mean, the entire industry is coming to the, to your perspective that wider is better. Do you, do you feel, have you always been a foreigner in that regard? Were there other people who are ever preaching the wide tire as early as you? Well, you know, it's come and gone. It's just sort of, there's always like a few decades of, of, of lag, but there were French riders, long distance riders in the 1920s who said, these wide tires, if you make them with the same casings as racing tires, they're just awesome. And I met some of these old guys who said, you should have known the tires we had in the 1940s. Oh my gosh. And so where can I find them? And I said, oh, they're all dried out. And they're, you know, somebody procured some rotten old tires and I tried to mount them on the rim and, you know, they crumbled into dust. And it's like, okay, but, but you know, it sort of made us think. Um, but like everybody, we accepted the orthodoxy, you know, higher pressures are faster, skinny tires are better. But at the same time, with something like Paris Press Paris, we thought, you know, if I'm doing a 10K time trial, I can tough it up. 
I pump my tires up to whatever, 150 PSI, you know, just below the bursting point. And if I'm uncomfortable for, what does it take, you know, 15 minutes or something, I can handle it, no problem. Mm -hmm. But in a 50 hour ride, if I'm uncomfortable for 50 hours, my power output goes down. Mm -hmm. So somewhere those two curves match. And we were wondering with our first test is, let's say we reduce our pressure a little bit and we gain, you know, we lose 5% in speed, but we gain 20% in comfort. That's probably worth it for that long a ride. So we started testing what happens on real roads if we lower the tire pressure. And it was a big surprise, nothing. We thought we'd go slower. We didn't go slower. We just got more comfortable. And we said, well, you know, something's wrong here. What can we do? So we tested again, different methods, different tires. We finally realized if tire pressure doesn't matter, it completely revolutionizes our thinking about tires. Because in the past you had to choose you want to have a skinny tire that's very supple and can go very fast. But if you make it wider, it can't accept high pressures. So we thought it was slow because it couldn't take high pressures. If you want to make a wide tire for high pressures, it gets very stiff because, well, I can go into the physics, but if you imagine the tire being like a chain and an elephant standing on each link, the longer you make the chain, the more load you have on the ends of the chain. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a chain of five links, you have five elephants pulling on the end. If you have a chain of 20 links, you have 20 elephants pulling on the links. Mm -hmm. So you can see how the problem gets very big. And that's why a 45 or 44 millimeter tire has like a max pressure rating of what, 60 PSI, whereas a 28 has a max pressure rating of 105, even though it's the same tire. And in the past, we always thought, okay, 60 PSI is so slow, let's not bother with it. And nobody made that fast 44 millimeter tire. Mm -hmm. But once we figured out pressure doesn't matter, we said, wait a minute. We should go to that, you know, 60 PSI, 44 millimeter tire and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And we published that in Bicycle Quarterly. Back then, we didn't make tires. And we thought, okay, this is going to revolutionize the world. <laughs> and nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can guess that. And so we thought, well, but we have proof, you know, we have this tested, we have statistical analysis and so on and so on, coming from a science background. And then we realized, we should make our own tires, you yeah. know, let's not wait for the rest of the industry to catch up. And that's how Rene Ars became a tire maker. Huh. Oh, that's fascinating. So, I mean, you, you have certainly convinced me and that's what I've loved in my post world tour career is using wider and wider tires and, and at no penalty. I mean, you have more comfort, more traction as a result of a wider patch on, on the pavement, uh, more control of just a better, more, more, fun, comfortable ride. Why do you think the transition is so slow? It's you mean the transition the of... Fit. I mean, it's what the bike can fit. You know, it's like people are like, oh, I have a road bike. It can only fit a 26 millimeter tire. Now I have a gravel bike. It can fit a 38. So then you get a gravel bike that can fit a 48. Like if people can't fit the tires into their frames, they're not going to do it, you know? And yeah. then everybody always crams the biggest tire they can because they're like, oh, this is way better. You know, up to like a certain point, they're not going to put like a four inch tire into, you know, like a, a road bike. That's not going to happen. But like sure. as as the industry changes, it's like everybody will fit the biggest tire they can every time for endurance. Yeah, it was funny riding with you last autumn. Lael came to Seattle and she had the newest Diverge and it fits 48 millimeter tires. We mm -hmm. tested the first Diverge. It was a tight fit with 35s and Specialized back then was really proud and said, look, we have a bike for such huge tires and wow, you know, it's a gravel bike. And we were saying, really? I mean, you need to go a little bit up. Now we have road bikes that fit 35s. Right. Yeah. So it's really changed, as Lael says, you know, it's like the industry is catching up. It is, and I still think it's so, I mean, especially from the road racing side. I was just on a podcast last week, and I hope the host of that podcast is now watching because I just sent him the link. <laughs> he said that he was he was very excited that he's using a 20 I think he was saying he's using a 25 his bike has clearance for 30 and he's hmm. still using a 25 but that is a graduation from a 23 so I, my perception is if you have a staunch road pedigree then mm -hmm. it's really hard to make that transition of wider is better um so I mean Jan like I receive hundreds I Go ahead. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, in terms of Formula World Racing, we were on 21.5s, you know. And, yeah. uh, and uh, I remember them at like 120 PSI. And it was a really important race. It was 130 PSI. You know, now uh -huh. I'm just like thinking. <laughs> and then when we tested tires, I realized that's so slow, you know. Especially with tubulars, you're actually slower at higher pressures. But really, I think what's happening is, um, first of all, it's just the, the old cycling culture of, you know, narrow tires are faster, a racing bike is the fastest one, wide tires are touring tires, and so on. Um, and I think it takes a long time to unlearn that. There's, uh, you know, there's also the idea that, you know, what we feel as vibrations is also mm -hmm. how we identify speed. Just like, you know, people tell you in a convertible car, you feel like you're going 100 miles per hour at 40 because the wind's going by you so fast. Yeah. And uh, so the narrow tires make you feel faster because the vibrations are higher frequency. So it's sort of the same. It's like a placebo effect. With a wide yeah. tire, you take out the vibrations and you feel really slow until you look at your friend and say, are we going really slow today? And he says, no. And I realize, oh, I'm on 48 millimeter tires. That's why it feels slow. Sure. Have you experienced that? Like at first, that just it feels slower because you're on the wide tires and the lower pressures, and yeah, I think it is a perception thing because because I will go out on a on a ride with my 32 Stampede Pass, and that will feel fast, and then it might feel not it it might not feel as fast when I'm out on say 38 C slicks or even 44. I run 44 C slicks all the time. The perception of speed isn't there until I finish the ride and I look at two files and the files are virtually the same. The speed oh. is the same, the power is the same. You're right, that's I mean, what, perception. I mean, that's what we found. We do a lot of tests, like roll down tests and so on, very carefully controlled. And, you know, I, I mounted some tires here so we can look at it a bit, but you know, here is the 32 that Ted said, and here's the 44. And at first, how can we get this in the photo or in the thing? At first, it's hard to believe, you know, that the fat tire is just as fast as the other one. But really, there's no difference between the two um, in rolling resistance and even air resistance when you go. We've only tested it up to about 20 miles per hour because above that, it gets too hard. You're only testing wind resistance because, you know, the rider sort of moves ahead a bit or something. Um, but there's, there's no real difference in speed. There's a difference in feel. There's a difference in how the tire flexes, which might affect your speed just because of your power output, but it's not in the tire itself. You know, there's there's no real um, difference. At least, you know, we tested really carefully up to 44, so you're at the upper end, Ted. Mm -hmm. And realistically, probably the four, uh, 48s and 54s also run just as fast. Um, what Leo was saying about, you know, the four inch tire or something, the problem just really gets to make a bike, a performance bike that fits around that. Because right. you have road cranks and, you know, how do you, you know, then chain stay needs to go in between somewhere. And one reason like a fat bike is slow is not just the tires are slow, but the chain has to move around this huge tire mm -hmm. somehow. So you're pedaling mm -hmm. duck footed and there's all kinds of yeah, things. And really. somewhere around 55 seems to be the limit of what you can do with a road bike. Mm -hmm. yeah. you now even with curved chain stays and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And how about how would do you suppose rider weight has any uh, like where does that fit into the algorithm? If there uh, is an algorithm, or is the algorithm just simply wider is better, full stop? Um, I would say up to forty four, we can say for sure. You know, I mean, as a scientist, I can can make make statements beyond that. I usually ride forty twos just because uh, my bike fits them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, realistically, yeah, rider right weight probably you benefit more from wider tires the heavier you are, of course. Um, and this is all for smooth roads. Now you imagine mm -hmm. rough roads, of course, there's no question. I mean, if you're even on a smooth gravel road, going to a narrow tire will make you slower. There's no doubt about it because you have so much vibration and it's, you know, it's, it's easy to measure. Mm -hmm. Now, I know Lale and I ride off-road quite a bit. And mm -hmm. you've, you've put together some pretty convincing studies that also show that a knobby tire, your knobby tire, is not, you're not suffering from any speed penalty as well. And is that, how well, do you- I, can, I mean, I can attest to that with the Oracle Ridge tire, the 48s, it, which I, I don't know all the design that's gone into it, but it's basically silent when you're riding it even on like a paved bike path and just as fast. But the thing for me is like, I like having different experiences on different bikes, but I don't like 
messing around with my equipment a lot. So if the bike's set up with these knobby tires, I'm just going to ride that for the next three months, you know, and that's basically it. So it's like on road, on dirt, it's just going to be the same. And then I'll switch to like a road bike with narrower slick tires. And it's, I'm not necessarily always looking for what's fastest, but I'm like, well, that feels different. That feels fun. I should ride that bike now because that's what I want to do, you know? And then if I'm like more focused on a specific race, then that's when I'm, I'm focused on optimizing my equipment. But I would say from the experience riding the Oracle Ridge 48s, the knobby tires that they're extremely fast on everything. It's like, it's like no downside of having them just for around town too. And, um, and I didn't compile data for that, but I never felt like I regretted having the tires for what I was doing. Um, that's not, you know, that's not across the board for every knobby tire. It's just specifically that tire. I felt that way. That's awesome. <laughs> I had well, a we just, we just tested this because, you know, I mean, we first developed the tires. We can't test them until we have them and have getting good conditions and so on. But your, your impression is actually correct for higher speeds. Um, there's no difference. You know, it's hard to believe that we have, you know, the, the knobby and the slick here, same, same width. And they were all the same. You know, we just put up a blog post that uh, we can refer people to later that shows the data. But, um, and uh, of course, like you say, not all knobbies do that. What we basically did is we didn't look at the knobby like most people. Most people look at the knobby as a slick tire and they stick knobs on top. And they're all different heights and different sizes and so on. And they squirm and move and so on. What we did is we took basically a slick tire and cut away the space between the knobs. So that you have a smooth surface you're still rolling on. And the hard part was to keep the knobs big enough that they don't squirm, but make them small enough so they dig into the ground. Because after all, that's why a knobby gives you better traction, is that it, you know, interlocks with the ground. And um, anyway, we did. <laughs> it was really fun seeing Lael on the Oracle Ridges on the paved descents how far she leaned the bike into the corners. I was on some prototype tires and I'm usually riding the smooth tires. So I wasn't as used to the f different feel you get with the knobbies. I had a hard time following you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Of Yandesan course on the uphill, I had an even so harder time fast. following you, but that's. Oh boy. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm just, you know, I rode in Alaska for the entire summer on those tires. So I was just, it's like you spend this time on, on these tires and it just feels like it's part of you, you know, after, after that much time. And that's, that's such a good feeling. And then, I mean, that's the whole thing of like trusting your equipment in, in like, whether it's like an equipment issue or a mental issue of, of where you're stopping, you know, and if you spend more time on it, then, then you just know what it'll actually do. Um, and mm -hmm. then you're happy with it. So I'm thrilled with those tires. And the original idea was I wanted them for, uh, the tour divide for my rear tire because I'm concerned about the mud. I ride a specialized Epic and it has limited mud clearance. So I was like, Jan, I really want the 48 millimeter tire for the rear. Um, and then the next version of the Diverge, the specialized Diverge fit that. And so then I was just thrilled because it's like now what was like something I thought was more for a hardtail is now a gravel, a gravel tire, you know? And like, for me, it's like, I'm not designing bikes. I'm I'm not designing tires. So then when the equipment is actually available, I'm just so happy with that, you know, so. Yeah, but that was really on. gratifying. I mean, working with both of you, Ted came to us and said, you know, I can see you ride in the Cascades and maybe you even ride fast, but you can see where you're going because you're with one or two friends and, you know, and your rocks are all smooth or whatever, they're not, but still. <laughs> Whereas, you know, in a gravel race, of course, I can totally see it. You know, you're in a peloton, you're going 30 miles an hour, you don't see anything where you're going. So rocks fly right and left, and you need a completely different tire. That's why we made the endurance casings uh, based on your needs. You know, I'm not expecting you to, to come up with the technical things, but, you know, identify sort of where the need is. And the same thing with Lael. She said, well, you know, I said, what do we need for bikepacking? What do you need for bikepacking? She said, well, first of all, I need a 48 for the rear because the 55 doesn't fit. And secondly, we talked about how it's such a mix of surfaces. You know, some parts are paved, some parts are gravel, some parts are mud, mm -hmm. snow. So how can we make a tire that can do all of that and not just is specialized in one place? And um, that's where the noise canceling came in because I thought, you know, the last thing you want after a long ride, you're heading into town or something and the tire goes, yeah. and, you know? <laughs> and I think actually that's one reason why... Uh, not as fast as 
and because of the noise. And once you write the noise cancelments, where we set up in a way that the frequencies overlap so that they cancel each other. Um, and mm -hmm. as Lael says, it actually does work. Um, yeah, it does. <laughs> and so suddenly that perception, you know, because so much of riding bikes is perception. You know how yeah. it is. Like you say, you come back from a ride and you think, oh, today I was slow. You look at the data set and there's no difference. You know, mm -hmm. but if you hear brr, 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 the whole ride, you think, oh, this is really slow. I mean, for me, squeaking chains are that way. You know, if my chains yeah. squeak, it just drives me crazy. Yeah. I can hardly continue riding, you know? It's like, in theory, I know it doesn't slow me down, but it's like, anyway. Sure. So, is do you have any particular trick to the trade for choosing a tire? I mean, Leo, you said, you know, you have Oracle Ridge and they're, it's sort of perfect, set it and forget it. Um, the, <laughs> we, we should, we should tell you that we have a different tire for each terrain. And, you know, even during Route of Vermont, you can switch tires at the halfway point. And we would sell so many more tires. I mean, look at Lael. She rides one set of tires all year. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I mean, I have, I'm glad that you talk about having both a mountain bike and, and a gravel bike for a tour divide, for example. I maintain, you know, a couple of road bikes, a couple of gravel bikes, a couple of mountain bikes, and mm -hmm. auras. So it's, it's it's amazing how many sets of tires that we end up having to go through. Um, so as a result, I am asked very frequently. I can't even begin to imagine how many how how many questions come in as, as the owner of a tire manufacturer. Um, what I, I suppose the question is: What are your rules for choosing any particular tire? And I, the question goes to both of you. Do you want to yeah. start, Lael, or? Sure, I'll start. So I, I look at, you know, most of the riding I'm going out for is longer distance. So it's going to be definitely a mix of terrains. But I'm like, OK, what's the focus? So like taking the Tour Divide, for instance, 2,750 miles, mixed dirt, mostly dirt, but some pavement, sometimes rough, but mostly pretty good gravel. But the distance is so long that, uh, you know, I'm definitely going to choose a 2.2 inch tire, even if like a 38 would be great for day rides on this route. And, and the thing is, like, I got into this sport from touring. So the first time I toured that route, I was actually on like inch and a quarter tires just because that's the bike I had. And it was fine. You know, it, it works, but is it fastest? So then I'm like, over this distance, what's actually going to be the fastest? And a 2.2 is going to be the fastest because you get so physically beat up. And then the rest of the, the same idea goes with the rest of the equipment. I, I raced it twice with a flat handlebar with like bar ends on a rigid fork. And then I went back to it because now I have like, my hands are so beat up. My wrists are so beat up from riding a rigid fork for so long that now I ride a suspension fork and it's so much better. You know, it's like, I'm so much happier for the descents. I'm happier for the washboard. I'm happier. And for me being happier on the bike means I'm going to ride farther, faster. You know, so I'm trying to average like 200 miles a day for 14 days, 15 days, you know, and like day after day, if I have less pain, then I'll go farther. So having a bigger tire, having suspension. I mean, I've even thought like maybe I should have a full suspension bike with drop bars, you know, and, and I mean, and I have aero bars on this bike and that's not to be aerodynamics, just to move my body around. You know, it's like moving your your back forward. So for that, it's 2.2s. But then if I was like going to go back and ride it as a stage race or ride it like, you know, as a tour, I might pick the gravel bike because I'm like, I don't need that big of a bike and it, I might have more fun riding something different, you know? So it's like, am I looking at performance like specifically like in a racing scenario for multi-day or is it a single day or is it half a day, you know, and then going from there, same with like casing. Uh, so for the tour divide, I'll run endurance casing because I don't want to have any problems. If I'm home in Tucson, even if there are cactus and other things around on the road, I'll, I'll ride extra light casing because it's more fun. Because then I'm like, oh, this is awesome. You know, it feels great. It's fast. <laughs> if I have a problem, it's not a big deal. It's not a game breaker. And like, I just want to have that experience on the bike. I want to like feel good that day, you know, and I'm not looking at like, okay, end of the world. Like I have to have the most reliable equipment. It's like, can I make it home? Yeah. So then that's fine. You know, so then and then I think it's fun to like play around with this stuff and see what actually performs day after day. And uh, could you lighten up your equipment, you know, like and then be faster, have better results, have a better time. So I think it's worth uh, mixing it up if you have the opportunity to do that. 
and you know I do because I work with Jan and, and he lets me ride these really awesome tires so that's part of it but before that you know on the tour divide I was always riding mountain bike tires and those are definitely slower you know and they're knobby they're supposed to be like cross-country tires but cross country versus gravel, they're, they're different things. You know, you're running into different terrain. You have different goals. I'm not racing for an hour. I'm racing for two weeks. Mm -hmm. it's, it's different, but most of the people like bikepacking so niche that uh, people aren't making equipment specifically for that, but Jan actually is. So that's really cool. You know, what a gift. I mean, that's awesome. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, usually our products start with what we need you know that's our initial tires we said okay we need some different tires for long distance riding we love the gravel roads and the cascades and so on and so the same thing with Leo. she comes to me and says i need a 48 for the rear of my of my hardtail and i'm thinking well you know if Leo needs it there are probably many people who need it and i'm just amazed that nobody else makes it if mm -hmm. you know that's what your bike fits so we make it and it's one of our best selling tires because cool. you're not alone you know? <laughs> <laughs> but i think what you what you touched upon is uh you know for for tire performance i think people focus on width because it's easy to measure they focus on weight they focus on pressure but those don't matter you know the width we talked about doesn't matter in fact i would say if you were if we were talking about doing the tour divide as a stage race i'd still have you on suspension because you're going to be mm -hmm. faster. Even even if it's just a one hour time trial, you're going to be faster on washboard with suspension than without. Yeah, that's true. You know, you're going to be faster on a 54 millimeter tire or 55, 2.2 than mm -hmm. on the 48 or 44, just because there's less vibration coming through. And the vibrations are all energy lost in your body. You know, when, when your body starts hurting, you feel it's getting warm. I mean, when we did our, our big testing of rough surfaces, we rode on the rumble strips that you have next to the highway. <laughs> uh, because you have a smooth surface and a rough surface, so you can compare. You know, you can mm -hmm. see how much more energy you need with a power meet on the rough surface with different equipment. And it was so clear that the wider the tire, the lower the pressure, the less the penalty was. And mm -hmm. with a 2.2, you can ride those rumble strips, and it's almost the same power output as on the smooth road. With mm -hmm. 25s, I can tell you, <laughs> you can hardly keep moving. It's like... Urgh. And uh, the other thing you feel with the 25s is how your body heats up. You know, you really feel that energy loss. So, yeah. you know, the idea that, that the narrower tire will be faster for a shorter distance, especially on gravel, is just not true. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the choice, first of all, like Lael said, it's about the casing, because that's really the one thing that matters for racing. And I'm sure uh, you remember Ted as a pro nobody rode stiff casings everybody was on handmade two wheelers mm -hmm. you know people even buy their own we are also distributors for fmb and i asked the guys from fmb so do you sponsor these pros who win perry roubaix on your tires and he said what do you mean they're customers you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. if they don't pay for their tires we're going to go bankrupt because they are our main customers and it's just you know people pay for their own tires because it makes such a big difference yeah sure so yeah, I mean the first step is the casing, and when you you know when you look at the casing, you have the the stiffer the casing is, the slower it's gonna be because it transmits more vibration and it's also harder to flex as the tire flattens at the bottom. Imagine a tennis ball versus like say a softball or something. You know the tennis ball you're gonna get tired pretty quickly. The softball you can squeeze all day and nothing happens. Um, the problem, of course, is with a like an ultra or extra light casing, it's gonna get thinner, it's not as cut resistant. You know, at some point you are you're reaching a limit where it's not feasible to ride it anymore. And that limit depends on the rider, you know. Some riders are light on the bike. Like looking at Lael, I'm thinking she could probably even ride the extra light casing, except she tells me in the tour divide, except she tells me if I have a flat at two in the morning on day fourteen, I'm just gonna be so mad at you. Upset. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, you know. You, you should use the, the endurance casing. And the endurance casing is basically, again, a very high-end casing that just has the threads, uh, you know, a little denser weave, so that makes it stronger, but also slower. And it has a protective layer underneath the thread and the sidewall. So it's much more cut resistant and so on. It's a little slower. It's not as slow as most gravel tires, because most mm -hmm. gravel tires start out as touring tires. And they're sort of low-end tires that they try to make fast, rather than high-end tires that they try to make tough. So we start with a high end tire and make it tougher, which is a different approach. And I can go into all the details, but other people don't do it. It's mostly cost. 
for big companies, the cost is so many layers ahead on top of it. For us, it doesn't really company that, um, how to say, there isn't that much of that. So we can spend a lot more on the, on the thread. And you can imagine making a 25 millimeter tire takes a lot less material than a 44, like three times as much. So, so yeah, yeah start with the casing and think about what you sort of, what you need and how light you can go. I mean, we have like with Ted, we developed even the endurance plus casing, which is mm -hmm. sort of, I would say the strongest casing you can get this side of a downhill mountain bike type. And that's again, because Ted says, well, if I'm in the lead group on, on a big race and it's really sharp rocks and I have a flat, well, the lead group is gone and it's over. Um, versus me riding with my friends in the Cascades and you know we have a flat or the Oregon Outback, if you had a flat there, big deal, you're by yourself, you spend three minutes fixing it or five and you continue. But if in a group, the dynamic changes so much. So, um, and after that, I would say just whatever you wanna ride, what you like for the feel of the bike more than anything. You know, and I think that's something that's easily overlooked is like what the bike feels like is how much power you put out in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so like a mountain bike is slow partially because it feels different, has a different riding position and so on and so on. And that's why some gravel bikes are so fast because they're basically road bikes with big tires. And, you know, it's just preference. Same with the tire pressure. If it feels too soft for you, it's too soft for you. If it feels too hard, it's too hard because all that affects how you put out power. It's just like the suspension bob on a mountain bike. You know, if you're bobbing all the time, you can't put out power. That's why the mountain bikes have a lockout. But if your tire pressure is too low on a gravel bike, it doesn't matter whether the resistance is like half a percent lower if you can't put out the power. Yeah. Perfect. I, I totally agree. If it if everything is going great, stick with it. If something feels wrong, do something different or, you know, find a way to it that you're actually going to enjoy it instead of just being like, well, this is the fastest. So-and-so told me it's the best. Forget it. You know, if it's not the best for you, it's not the best. So I think, I think there are options out there. There are things to change. And then if you don't have the capacity to change them in that moment, then stick with what you got. That's, that's what you have. Yeah, we often say we worry about bikes a lot when we're not riding so that we don't have to worry about them when we're riding. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, typically, we are going to save questions to the end, but we just sort of hit on it. Arkansas Dave asks, what tire would you recommend for Unbound 200? And Jan hit on it. Um, my personal preference is to run the Endurance Plus in either uh, Snoqualmie or uh, Hurricane Ridge, which are... 44 and 42 40. and 42. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're uh, actually pretty close because the knobs add a little bit of height. That's why we made them so they're mm -hmm. in the same bike. So, yeah, quick side note, wanted to throw that in. And I do run the Endurance Plus because I do not want to stop on the side of the road, as Lael's also alluded to. And whether that's a two-week mm -hmm. race or a 200-mile race, moving is faster than standing on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, on now, the other hand, you know, if I were riding that race, since I'm not going to be in the lead group anyway, <laughs> I would probably run the extra light casing unless it's super sharp rocks. Because it is, it is super sharp rocks. Yeah, it is super then, sharp rocks. Then yeah. maybe, okay. And there you is see what I'm saying. For, yeah. for many races, it just really depends also on where you are, how you race, and and what your tolerance is for fixing, fixing a flat, right. you know, I mean... I have two flats a year on the extra lights, riding on the gravel roads and the cascade. So it's not like I fix a flat every time. Yeah. But if I have to fix a flat, which usually is actually in the city, I haven't had a flat on gravel, I don't know how long. Um, it's not the end of the world. You know, I stop with the new, put the tube in and <laughs> keep going. <Come> <laughs> well, but you know, everybody's tolerance is different there. Um, but yeah, if it's, if it's super sharp rocks, and especially if you're in the lead group, go with the Endurance Plus. Especially if you have Ted's horsepower, you know. I mean, as we've been talking, I'm just thinking, Jan, I would love for you to ride Unbound the 200 That's... and ride the Tour Divide. And yeah. then you're like, and then see what you think <laughs> is like the best equipment, you know. I mean, Tour Divide is way too long. But you, usually... should ride, you should ride Unbound because like 
what a scene, you know, and then to see like how, what tires are the best, because I mean, like I rode the XL, but I had like a 2.1 inch tire. Uh, This was before the Fisher Ridge or uh, Oracle Ridge. And now I'm like, well, if I went back, what would I ride? Fisher Ridge or Oracle Ridge for a 350? You know, what would actually be faster? That's kind of a toss up. You know, I think the like, Feaster. I would, I would put you on you the think Feaster. think so? Yeah. Yeah, I plus mean, you I have would... lower pressure, which means less risk of flats, you know, because the harder the tire is, the easier it is to cut. Basically, at zero pressure, you you wouldn't get any sidewall cuts. I mean, so... I was so happy with, like, the 2.1s because, like, the descents, I never had to be careful. I could just, like, hammer the descents even in the dark. No problem. You know, and, like, sometimes you go through, like, drainages, and you're like, oh, that could be bad, and then it wasn't. So I think I think you're right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I think you should check out Unbound. I'd love to see you race it, Jan. I think it'd be super Someday, fun. Someday, maybe. I've always been tempted, but it's a long way. And um, and also, I'm not good on flat roads. And I know it's not flat, but I like the long climbs, as you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We should organize some sort of gravel race in the Cascades. I mean, there's such great terrain totally. here, but there's nothing. Yeah, yeah that would be really cool. That would do be it. really cool. Do it. So, so hinging off that last part of the conversation about having mishaps or not, we obviously don't ride our bikes in a vacuum. Things can happen out on the open road and all across the world. So can you, either of you think of a crazy tire mishap story that you've ever had to endure? Jan, do you want to go first? Sure. Oh, that was years ago. I remember it so clearly. Uh, we used to have these cross-state races, Cannonball and S2S, and there were just these crazy races. You get on the highway, you get off in Spokane at the other side of the state, so it's like 285 miles or so. And one year I decided, since I was preparing Paris for Paris, I'll just race it and ride back the next day. Um, and so, you know, I was a little tired that next day, and I realized why the race is always going east, because there was a strong headwind going back. And then sort of it was getting dark just as I was starting to climb into the cascades and i slashed my rear tire this was long before rene air's tires it was some belted super reinforced super strong tire and i almost cut it in half and i'm like what am i going to do now i'm like 150 miles from home and this you know what can i do and i remember the dollar bill trick so i put the dollar bill in and it lasted three miles and then boom dollar bill broke i thought Uh okay what can i do now and then i remembered energy bar wrapper might work better it seems stronger and it worked it was amazing i mean the tire was like half the circumference was cut and it was like going doom 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 with each with each revolution but i made it home the whole 150 miles through the mountains and um it's like i think that was the craziest mishap i should have probably carried carried a spare tire or something but you know it's a race i mean I was even just wearing a short sleeve jersey and I had some newspaper that I stuffed under the jersey for the morning. And then on the way back, it started raining and it was like, so cold. (laughs) I remember descending from Stephen's Pass at like three in the morning and there was nobody anywhere. And I almost turned, it almost turned me off long distance racing. (laughs) (laughs) It was so miserable. (laughs) And I but, never saw what I hit. That's the funniest thing. I look back, but it must have, like, the tire pressure probably flung it off into the ditch. and Yeah. Never to be seen again. <laughs> the yeah. goat. How about oh, you, Lil? Yeah. What's your crazy story? You got anything? Oh, man, I'm trying to think. I mean, like, for the, the – so I raced the Trans Am in 2016, and I was, like, so pumped that I could have tubeless tires uh, on a road bike you know, mm-hmm. with like 26 millimeter tires. I was like, this is awesome. I'll never have a flat. You know, this is the biggest deal ever. And then sure enough, I had like, I cut the sidewalls of the tires like halfway through the race and had to like, you know, put a, like an energy bar wrapper and a tube in it anyway. And then I got a new set of tires and I'm like, great, tubeless again. And then I cut the tire again and put a tube in anyway. So it's like, you know, you think you have these like miracle fixes and then it's like, whatever, you just deal with it. I was doing another time I was doing a a time trial down the Baja divide. So 1500 miles through Baja, Mexico. And I was so excited because I had these new uh, 29 by 2.6 tires. And I was like, this is the magical size for sand or whatever. And then, uh, but they were like, you know, a fairly light casing. And I got like a little hole in my sidewall 
And then I was like for the next, you know, five hours nursing it along with super glue to like, and then super glue and then pump it up and then a little super glue and pump it up. Like, because I was in the desert. So I'm like, I can't put a tube in there because there are all these cactus around. It's just going to get flat. So I was just like praying, you know, that this tire would hold. Cause I'm like, there's no alternative. There are no bike shops. Like the next bike shop is in like 800 miles. What do you do? You know? And then you're like, this could actually put me out. Like that's the biggest deal in the world is whether or not my, my tires can hold air. And that like, that's why I always run endurance casing for like a longer distance thing, because I'm like, mentally, I cannot deal with that again. Like I can't be like nursing this tire along, you know, and then not knowing if it's going to hold. And then yeah. eventually like it gums up, you know, whatever, whatever sand and grit gets in there. It's like, okay, it's okay. You know? And then you're so happy that it worked, but I'm like, oh, like, I, I just can't, like, I don't have the mental capacity to deal with that. So I'm like, okay, a little heavier, no problems. I'm just moving forward. Now let's deal with the other problems with the bike. <laughs> It's not just the tires, you know, it's like, okay, what's going on with my brake pads? What's going on with my chain? You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, have you ever been out there and you just run out of chain lube? And then you're like, oh, dear God, you're like putting like mayonnaise on your chain or something. Yes. Like, you're like, oh, I, just, I just can't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> One time I had like hand sanitizer. <laughs> I mean, that, oh, man. you know, I think there might have been some aloe in it. So that helped. <laughs> <laughs> You're like looking for the aloe plant in order to harvest a little bit of extra aloe. Anything. You're yeah. like, I can't deal with this anymore. You know, that's when you just need headphones and music and uh -huh. don't think about it anymore because there's nothing you can do, you know. But the bike still I, works. Yeah, things happen. I had a prototype hub one, the generator hub, and mm -hmm. I did the Red Pyrenean, which goes from the uh, Mediterranean, you know, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean to the Pyrenees, all the passes that you see in the Tour de France in one stretch. And the hub started squeaking because there was some sort of pressure compensating system in there and it wasn't wound correctly and it didn't have more resistance, but there was just a little plastic tube that was rubbing on the hub body. So oh. 39 hours and 52 minutes oh, I rode God. and it went squeak, squeak, squeak. Oh, yeah, and yeah. you know, the funny thing is it bothered me a lot at first and then I forgot about it. And now when I remember the ride, I don't remember the squeaking. Yeah. I just yeah. remember the beautiful ride and, you know, and it was just awesome. And, and the, you know, the moonlight on the Tourmalet and all oh, the stuff. That's cool. And uh, the squeaking is, is long gone. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. They improved the hub after that, by the way. <laughs> that's good, too. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. We've got a whole bunch of questions coming in. Um Let's jump. I mean, they're they're largely tire related. In your experience, this can be directed to anybody out in the audience. I mean, anybody among our esteemed panel. In your experience, are punctures more likely to occur on the sidewall or the tread? And a related follow up: Does a wider tire have a greater propensity to get a puncture due to the increased area on the pavement? Um, we looked at that quite some detail because we thought that too. It's all about pressure. So really the wider tire gets less uh, punctures because it has a much lower pressure. So what would puncture a narrow tire, and I'm not sure whether you remember that, Ted, but when I was racing, if somebody got a flat, it was like almost like a gunshot. You know, the pow of 130 PSI suddenly escaping and somebody wobbling like crazy, everybody, you know, going around them because, because they lost control of their bike almost immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically at zero pressure, you can't puncture the tire because there's nothing pushing back. Mm -hmm. So um, the wider tire runs at lower pressure, which means it's harder to puncture in the tread. And also the sidewall is harder to abrade because again, it just you know, push, it gives when you push against it. Um, you know, imagine if you're trying to cut something and if something really soft and you're on a soft surface, you can't cut it. You know, you need to put it on a hard surface to cut it. Mm -hmm. And so you need the pressure behind it. Um, otherwise, just nothing, nothing happens. That's why the white tires have so much fewer punctures that, you know, I wouldn't ride an extra light casing in the 26 in the city because you get a lot of flats, but in the 42 that I have on my city bike, I can ride the extra lights in the city. Of course, I don't ride to the gutter where all the, you know, the debris collects and stuff and everybody's oh. experience is different. Maybe if I lived in New York City or something. 
But basically, short answer is wide tires, lower pressures, fewer flats. Is that your experience? Uh, 100%. Yes. And I, I mean, I have the same vivid memories of when you, when you often are puncturing 120 PSI, it's a deafening blow. Um, yeah. I, Especially if the guy's in front of you, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, bam. Sure. And, and my experience in wider tires has come since my world tour retirement. And, and immediately it was, it was working with you and working with, with clinchers with sealant. And I mean, I, I virtually don't have flat tires. Um, I mean, I hardly will notice every once in a while I'll have to plug something and that's once in a blue moon. I'm plugging once a year. Um, I'll knock on wood right there. But yeah, I've, I've certainly experienced far fewer flats now than in a previous lifetime. I used to go, go come back from training rides and have two flat tires, three flat tires. I mean, it's, it's, it's comical how many I used to have versus what I have now. Yeah, I mean, I remember like Lael, we rode what? 400 miles or something in the Cascades, and of course no flat tires. I mean, it yeah. wasn't even an issue. We didn't say, oh, we were so lucky we didn't have a flat tire. It's, it doesn't even cross your mind anymore. Right. You don't think about it till it's a problem. Unless exactly. you're like, oh, well, I'm, you know, you get caught in your head and you're like, oh, I'm going to be out there for so long. What am I going to do? And But that's like your own like fears. It's like packing your fears instead of reality sometimes, you mm -hmm. know? Like if you don't have a problem, then you got away with it. Great. And it was probably like more fun on lighter tires. So, you know, I think I, I'm like testing that out more because I'm like, this is so much fun to ride. And then if I'm riding in Washington, then maybe that's fine. If I'm riding in Arizona, maybe it's not, you know, it's like different terrain requires different things too. And then I think we should, we should change for that if we can, you know, because it's like, you should ride the lightest tires that you can. It's the most fun. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it is the most fun. But then if you, you know, you're going to be out there for three months, you're like, okay, I better start with something good. Um, I mean, because it's like then at the end of it, you see people like for a race like in Kyrgyzstan, the Silk Road Mountain Race, like people came in with like their clothing stuffed in their tires. Like one guy, <laughs> oh my gosh. one guy rode from Switzerland to the race and then raced it and then came into the finish riding on his rims, you know, oh. and you're like, well, that's not good. You know, like you should, you should have gotten like new tires before you started the race or something like that. Like, you know, yeah. like this is stuff like that you could avoid. If you're setting out for a thousand miles, start with something solid, you know, yeah. don't start with like your, the chain you've ridden for 10,000 miles already. It's going to break, you know, like all this stuff breaks, no matter what, it, what, what it's made out of, it's going to break. It's going to wear out. That's, that's just how it is. So, you know, set yourself up for success, you know, for whatever you're doing. And then don't deal with that, you know, but I guess that's just how it goes. Sure. Um, okay, a bunch more questions. I know the answer to this before I even ask it. I am riding 90% tarmac, 10% gravel and dirt. Is there any reason to run knobs over slick if I have one wheel set and don't want to switch them? <laughs> you know, that's a great question because um, it really depends on your comfort level on the dirt. Um, and what your dirt looks like. You know, if it's loose gravel like we have in the Cascades, uh, as you remember, Ted, when we were descending, I was on smooth tires, you were on uh, knobbies. There was no difference because it's all rocks sliding on rocks anyway. It's not like you have traction by digging into the surface. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine Vermont or especially places where it gets muddy or on snow, you absolutely need the knobs because they, you know, dig into the surface. Unfortunately, it's an easy choice. I mean, on pavement, the knobbies, as Lael says, and as we have tested, roll pretty much as well, at least at high speeds, as the slicks. So you could run the knobbies. They wear out a little faster because there's a little less rubber. So um, on the other hand, I usually run the slicks on gravel because it doesn't really make a big difference in the traction unless it's muddy or... So I'd say either one, try both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, that's what, it's been fun as I've used the tire, the Rene Air's tires and, and going, you know, arriving at different events and basically preaching the message of the tires, which are to what you just alluded to. I'm running slicks way more than I ever would have previously guessed because I'm riding a wider tire at lower pressures. I have just as great traction as if I were, um, as if I had knobbies based on the terrain. And 
and so it's counterintuitive that I can show up on a slick when everybody else in the Peloton is running a knobby tire. Um, and then also counterintuitive, knobby tires run, Renee's knobby tires run very quickly. So, you know, I can show up on a, a road group ride with knobby tires and grant that I have a fair amount of horsepower, but I can be just fine. And it just, it blows people's minds, but, but you know, you're not penalized for these particular tires anyway. Yeah. I think running knobs is not, not going to be a penalty. Um, so hinging no. off that question and my own answer and now good old question coming in, people want to know about what tires they're going to be using for rooted. Uh, Jan, you just alluded to it. We have, we have a good mix of, you, you were talking about the type of dirt that we're going to have at, at Rue de Vermont, we largely have packed gravel. I mean, it's it's gravel roads that are used as municipal travel. So those are really well packed. They're very fast rolling, but then we also have class four roads. So it is a toss up because you don't want to end up in a class four in you know, pinch flat because you're running too narrow of a tire. Um, for me, I would highly recommend either of the 38C tires. So a Stellacum, that's the, the tire with a bit of knob or uh, Barlow Pass at 38C. You know, both of those perfect for the for the conditions. Um, it's mid-August. Chances are it's going to be dry, but we might run into a bit of mud based on you know when the most recent rain was. So, long story short, that would be my recommendation. Um, we can't wait to have either of you come out to Vermont and ride some of our our finest gravel. Um, <laughs> How long is the race? Say that again. How long is it? It's, I mean, it's a, it's hardly an opener for you. We have what a 48 mile and an 82 mile option, but it's a whole weekend festivity. It's nothing but fun. Cool. There's camping. You can ride here from Alaska or Arizona Perfect. or wherever you are at the time. <laughs> let's yeah, do it. That sounds great. Let's do it. Nice. Um, let's see. How about, do you feel like your climbing suffers once you get beyond 32 C on your road bike? My knee-jerk answer is absolutely not. Um, 32 is the narrowest tire that I run. Um, that is what is on my beautiful Cannondale out in the garage right now. Uh, I love my 32s, and I do not feel penalized whatsoever in a 32. I think yeah. for me, it's, it's actually more complex than that. It depends more on the tire pressure. On some bikes, I'm doing better with a wider tire and a lower pressure because it gives me a little bit of give. And uh, I'm not pushing, you know, against sort of concrete, but it all depends on your preference. You know, there are probably some people who on my Firefly with its 54 millimeter tires would say, oh my gosh, this is way too squishy and I can't get any power down. And other people would say, this is awesome. And the bike just springs forward. So I'd say again, it's not the tires, it's more how the bike feels. Yeah, I think it would be overall more about the bike itself you know it's like now i'm riding on road a specialized athos and the other thing is i spend a ton of time standing like probably 50 percent of my riding is standing up so then it's like how does your bike respond to that you know and that bike is so snappy and it fits a 32 so i'm thrilled because yeah. i don't want to ride anything more narrow than that but then i'm like it's more about you know how the bike responds to like standing up charging up a hill you know and that's when you feel your fastest climbing and then you're like, well, bigger tires are more about descending than climbing. You know, when you're climbing, you just want to like power up it however you can. It's less about like that comfort. It's more about like when you go back down, how's that going to feel? And a bigger tire is definitely going to make you feel better on a descent for any cracks in the road, for anything that you feel along the way down. Because you're going a lot faster too. You know, like your speed is a lot higher. So you're going to feel more vibrations. You're going to feel more of the road texture um, when you're doing that. How about, what are your experiences with 650 and 700s? Any input on what is, the question is what on any input on which one of these do you think is better? Um, better is a, is a general word. Let's start with Jan, what do you think? 650 or 700, I know you have, this could have been an hour long conversation purely about that. It could be an hour long conversation purely about that. Uh, Speed-wise, there's no difference. We've tested that many times. Um, basically, people think that the bigger tire rolls faster because it, you know the approach angle is different. 
But what they overlook is the tire is flat at the bottom anyway. And what matters is how much the tire absorbs the road irregularities without lifting up the bike. You know, you don't want to do this on every bump, but you want to go, you know, smooth. Um, the main difference is the handling. I think one thing that Lael was alluding to why the big tires feel different is um, the wheel gets so big that, you know, rocking the bike feels so different. And since I love how a road bike feels, when I go to bigger tires, I go to smaller wheels so that they maintain that feel. And so that's why, for example, the Firefly I talked about earlier has 26 inch tires, because that way I have the same feel with a 54 millimeter tire as mm -hmm. I get with the 700 by 20 by, by 32. And when I rock out of the saddle and, you know, climb and stuff, it feels the same. Um, so it's not about speed. It's more about how you want the bike to feel. What's your experience, Ted? You've ridden quite a bit on the, on the, um, I forget the name, the uh, candidate top stone. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I was dyed in the wool, same believer, like you mentioned before, intuitively bigger must be faster. Um, I have I have the the luxury to ride a whole bunch of bikes, and the Top Stone has Zip has made me some 650s with a lefty up front, um, a couple of sets in fact. And again, data two files they say the same speed. I mean, I can ride virtually the the exact same course at the exact same power and get the exact same speed. Um, it is a perception thing. I mean, Jan, you've alluded to it a lot. It's it it what ma it is what makes a rider happy. Um, a rider should make that jump that a 650 is not a slower wheel. And once you can make that leap, both in your mind and, and see it in raw data, it's, it's, it's fun because these tires are super fun. I mean, having a 48 C on a top stone, I realize that's still narrow to some of you out there, but for me, that's plenty wide right now. Just based on it. It's a blast. I just truly freaking love it. Yeah. And by the way, I want to mention on our blog today or our journal, we put out uh, some of the data that I was talking about here because I figured, you know, I don't want to hold up some charts here and say, can you see this? So it's all there. You can go to reneairs.com and go to journal and you can see it and uh, basically just see the measurements that sort of, you know, how we arrived at all this stuff. That is a, a perfect time to wrap since we are over an hour. I was going to say that exact question. Where can we find you out there? Um, yeah, ReneeHairsCycles.com. Definitely check out that data. The blog that, that Jan puts out is absolutely fascinating. Uh, get yourself a subscription to Bicycle Quarterly because that's equally fascinating. Uh, Lael, where can our viewers find you online or elsewhere? Yeah, uh, Instagram for more frequent updates. And then we have some really good videos, most of them by Rue on YouTube. And then I also write for Bicycle Quarterly uh, at time. So you can read them there. That is but Lael's videos are amazing. I mean, it's so inspirational to see because it's not about winning. It's not about racing. It's really just about the experience of being out there and and you know seeing the landscape and experiencing the country i mean for me i find i find it's like one of the best yeah of course i love ted stuff too it's amazing <laughs> you know and, and to some degree one of the reasons i like working with both of you is because you have that appreciation that goes beyond just watts and power and winning mm -hmm. sure well we appreciate you jan um our audience we definitely appreciate you tons of questions have come in and Goodness gracious, don't know what else to say. I thank you, I thank you both. I thank you all very much and I will bid you adieu. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Jan. Thank Good you. Have a great night, guys. Thank you.